Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Learn more about Roberta's at robertaspizza.com. We talk about food, we talk about music, with musical dudes, finger on the pulse, snacky tunes. Hello and welcome to Snacky Tunes. I'm your host, Darren Bresnitz, and I turn on the disco ball today for Jumbo Time Wines as co-owner Jonathan Yadigar swings by to talk shop about his fantastic wine label. He shares the story of that first sip of wine that changed his life forever, how he got the business off the ground, and what tunes pair perfectly with some of his bottles, like their fantastic chilled reds. If you want to hear the playlist, we have a link in our episode description. He also shares some Snacky Tunes exclusives, as do we, so make sure you listen through the whole chat. And then we dig into the archives for a psychedelic performance from New York rockers Sun Voyager. They swung by in 2018 to chat about their then-recent release and play some live tracks from the album. So please sit back, relax, and enjoy Snacky Tunes here on Heritage Radio Network.
Jonathan, welcome to Snacky Tunes. I know you've had a busy week bottling the next round of wine for all your loyal fans and future enjoyers. So thank you for sitting down and chatting with me. I really appreciate it. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, uh, one thing I know about Jumbo Time Wines and, and you is that you guys are big fans of music and music ties deeply into the culture and vibe around your wine. And I, I like to think of all the, the wines that have popped up in the last few years as sort of like the indie labels from like the late 90s, 2000s. Um, how would you describe Jumbo Time's wines as a record label or through that lens? Yeah, that's a good question. I I think uh, the crossover is like MF Doom meets, you know, old disco, right? So like, yeah. you know, you look at those old MF Doom albums, R.I.P., um, like mm, food, like, you know, they're bright and colorful and there's mm-hmm. like so much storytelling. And then, you know, it's I grew up loving rap. And, you know, as I got older, I started listening to a lot of the samples and, you know, a lot of soul mm. samples, a lot of disco samples. Mm-hmm. And then I started listening to that music and like, that's kind of what's the, you know, the background noise of what I always have going on. So it's like Curtis Mayfield, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that, like, you know, that just energy and fire and like that bright, you know, I feel like there's a disco ball in my head every time I'm thinking about a label design. So that's kind <laughs> of the, the, the crossover I see there. I mean, it's always that interesting moment when you're like, wait, this song isn't all original. There's a sample. And then you start learning about the backbone of, you know, where music and culture and, and sort of where that came from and then how people took it and flipped it and made it their own. Yeah. When I first found Isaac Hayes, I was, my mind was blown. I was like, Oh, this is where, <laughs> you know, like this is, this is all the songs I grew up listening, you know, like, so. Yeah. Uh, you're like, Oh, these break beats and these drum fills are, were just lifted and sampled and reworked. Um, I want to go back a little bit because it's easy to look at, at you now with, the one that's been around for about three years and to think about, Oh, it's always been a wine guy, but you know, wine itself wasn't sort of in or as popular as it's always been. Um, When did, when did it get on your radar? When did you first start thinking about it? When did you first start ordering it instead of maybe like a beer and a shot or some sort of cocktail? Uh, so as someone that lives in the Midwest for six years, a beer and a shot was very much, uh, in my, (laughs) in my repertoire. So I'm glad, you know, I grew grew up in LA and there wasn't a lot of beer and shots. So like, I'm glad someone can uh, say that, but I'm from Philly and the Philly special is like a yingling and a shot of whiskey. So like you come out here, you're like, Oh, a beer and a shot. I think it's driving culture. People are like, "We, we just, we can't put this on the table, which by the way, I, you know, I love Yingling and I don't get why more people are not aware of the world's oldest beer, but we can, we can table that conversation. Well, I think Yingling, I think the founder had a couple of comments that came out in the last oh, year. Got it. Well, there you go. Well, then they, maybe it's deserved. They deserved. So Midwest shot in a beer guy. Yeah. I was well, wine. more of uh, more of just a massive beer nerd. Uh, sure. I, like, like, you know, it was food first, then it was beer. And I would just, you know, I went to college in Madison and there would be Mm. these breweries where you could only get those wines in Madison or like a tri-state area of Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana and work at the time after college, I moved up to Chicago and they moved me back to LA and I, uh, I'm never late to anything. I hate Mm -hmm. being late and I'll never forget. I, um, was invited to dinner at Marvin on Beverly Boulevard Mm -hmm. and normally like, you know, I'm on time, order my beer or whatever. Uh, and I was running late and they're like, we're going to order something for you. And, you know, normally I'm pretty opinionated what I, what I want to consume, but you know, I had to bite my tongue cause I was running late and I'll never mm-hmm. forget. Um, someone ordered some white wine for the table. It was Olivia Lemesson, Aligo test, the 2016 vintage. Uh, unfortunately he's no longer with us, but I had that wine and I was like, what? I, I couldn't comprehend that wine could taste like that. And like that nerdiness takeover, you know, rabbit hole I had with beer like exploded to a you know the nth degree when I got into natural wine so my siblings saw it and they uh signed me up for a wine club at Domain LA Mm. yeah they noticed that's awesome yeah which is really cool because uh the first time we ever sold our wine to anyone was Domain LA's wine club so that's a circle yeah and that was really special and you know they're incredible supporters to us so that's how I you know that's how I caught the bug 
you know, having almost no reference for wine and then being able to rattle off not just the maker of the wine and the wine, but the year and the vintage, remembering that, I think is probably one of the most intimidating parts about the idea of getting into wine because you're like, well, I, I don't have the memory. I don't even know the reference point or I don't, I can't remember what I'm drinking. Did you always have a mind for it because of, of the beer or was it something that you really had to work at? And is it something that people could work at if they want to get into wine? Yeah. You know, I've never really thought of that. I, you know, now reflecting, I think there are aspects of wine that are just like overcomplicated. Like for mm. instance, we'll describe a wine by its region, but also by its grape. So we, mm-hmm. we make a great, we make a great Chardonnay and people are like, do you have any white wine? I'm like, yeah, we have this beautiful Chardonnay. And they're like, yeah, I don't like Chardonnay. I'm like, okay, well, what do you like? Like, I like Chablis. I'm like, well, Chablis is a region in Burgundy <laughs> that all they grow is Chardonnay. And I, you know, are like, so it's like, and you know, it's not uncommon. So I think for me, it's just how my brain works in like yeah. organizing principles of like, I figured out a process. So it started with grapes and then understanding the region those grapes are grown and mm-hmm. then finding producers and then you know, once I found a producer that there was like some pattern matching of like, I like one wine and I like another wine, like, yeah, let me go deep there. And when you get deep into a producer, it's like, okay, who are other people in this area? And I think like zeroing in on a producer and focusing on the area they grow, because it can be overwhelming. You can get Pinot from the Jura, from, you know, Oregon, from Burgundy, from, you mm-hmm, know, mm-hmm. even Loire. And it's like, that can be a lot. So understanding, I think a producer and then like-minded winemakers was a really easy way for me to just kind of get into it. You know, it sounds so simple just to um, find a wine you like, find out who makes it and then see who their buddies are. But in a lot of ways back in the days, especially, you know, with music and indie labels now, you know, I feel like the algorithm has taken so much out of that. It's the same thing. It's like, you like this band? We'll see who the label mates are. Like see what region they're from. Oh, you like DC hardcore? Well, like I got a whole label for you. I got this guy in that you should check out and his bands as well. And once you start breaking it down to like, okay, I don't have to know all the wines at once. I can start breaking it out. It becomes a little bit more approachable. Yeah, for sure. I remember like, I forgot who the DJ was. Maybe it was like a track, but I got like when I was younger, like I think he was on young Turks on young Turks and then like all those DJs. And then like they would go tour festivals to get in, you know, and it's just like, I may be butchering the actual label, but either way that was a, that I guess that's how I kind of got into music too. It's like, you know, like a lot of the rap beef, beef growing up, it's like, you know, are you with Jay? Are you with Nas? So that, like, sure, sure. You know, so it's like, I would listen to all like the Rockefeller artists or. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Who's in their crew. So look, it's one thing to go from having a sip of incredible white wine uh, in LA to even getting the idea to start your own wine label. What made you think that you could get in the business? Did you have any ins or was it just, thinking let's roll the dice because we have a specific point of view on wine it's i I would say a hybrid so before jumbo time uh, i worked at sweet green for four and a half years Mm -hmm. and i would describe my time there as like an internal analyst that would jump department to department and kind of solve gnarly problems Mm. um you know just as a business scales and grows like you know you know what are what are some things that maybe we don't need to put a team around but someone can you know so I started in marketing and I, you know, had this culture role of culture development. Then I worked for the founders and I became, I went to our outpost team that I was a product manager. Then I worked on supply chain during the pandemic. So that gave me a lot of confidence of like, if you have something you're passionate about, which obviously wine was one of those things, you know, small businesses are about being a generalist. And I thought I had that under my belt. Mm. So that kind of gave me, you know, the confidence to do it, but I also needed to validate, is there something there? And I just kind of felt like there was something to be able to talk to people about wine that isn't daunting. And, mm-hmm. you know, we can make a very serious product with a lot of intention, but also not take it so seriously where people don't feel, you know, that they're intimidated. Wine buying for me, when I first got into it, it was super intimidating. So, mm-hmm. you know, part of that playful energy is to just provide someone the ability to, you know, this wine has grapes I like and it seems inviting. Let me go try it. And we hope that the product is nails that you want to get into our whole ecosystem of wine. And that's kind of the journey we're trying to grow with. You know, when I first started drinking natural wine, it was, you know, skin contact white wines and chilled reds. And as my palate's grown, you know, I like Cru Burgundy. I won't lie. You know, yeah, I, you yeah, know yeah. 
I like the normie stuff too. And for me, it's like, you know, we, we see so many, so many people get confused about what natural wine is and my intent from when I started the business and where it's at now is natural wine is about farming and then mm-hmm. you know, from there restraint in the cellar. And that's a lot more digestible to understand than like, cause there's no USDA certification of natural wine and there's, you know, <laughs> all these things. So like you can make a fun orange wine, you know, that's super hazy and, you know, or you can make a really dialed, beautiful structured Pinot that, you know, you can bring home for Christmas and your parents are like, okay, finally, I don't think my son is nuts that he's just drinking, you know, kombucha with alcohol in it. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, it's really you, mousy. It's really yeah. grassy. It's not really going with the turkey, my yeah, friend. Exactly. So, you know, and that's where we're at. You know, we we're making rosés and orange wines and chilled red wines, but we have a Syrah in barrel that will probably, you know, take a few years. You know, we have some really beautiful Pinot, as I mentioned. Like, we're now getting to do kind of both, and I think that's the big goal of just showing people. You can enjoy a product and it can, you know, grapes can just be fermented in different ways. And as long as the farming's there, why not? But let me go back a little bit because, you know, I cut my teeth on natural wine to the point where I don't even think it's, I was like, I didn't even realize it was a thing because all the people who were teaching me about wine, it was, you know, the Justin Cherno for Horseman or Natalie Michael over at Voodoo Vint, you know, like those people. So to even know that there was, um, something that people were upset about, uh, you know, made it seem like a little weird, but how do you go from understanding natural wine, liking natural wine, knowing all these sort of system analysis at, um, sweet green into launching your own company? Yeah. I think what was super helpful was in the peak of the pandemic. Um, all these wine shops were closed and, They didn't have online stores. I know this is going to sound crazy, but the two in particular that I shot, now they have great online stores, but Domain and Psychic Wines. Yeah. And I would buy for myself and I was friends with the owners and they would tell me, you know, what they, what's new in stock. And then I'd buy for my roommates then my roommates, significant others, and then my friends and then coworkers. And it just snowballed to the point where I was buying like tens of thousands of dollars worth of wine for people during the pandemic. Hmm. And it was an incredible way for me to really understand what customers do and don't know. And the commonality was they love natural wine. They just didn't have the right jargon. And, you know, they felt that they weren't equipped to shop for themselves. And I wasn't like I was, you know, uncracking some really difficult nut. It's just, I had, you know, more experience buying wine and knowing what I like. So I thought that really, you know, was crucial of how we decided to launch the brand, but um, more mechanically, I would just like cold call winemakers that I liked uh, to figure out someone to work with us, Um, which, you know, I quit my job without having a winemaker to help us with this, which was a whole other thing. But um, we got put in contact with uh, Jason, Jason Charles from Vinca Minor Wines, who said he'd be interested in letting us, you know, make some wine out of space and consulting for us. And uh, Jason helped us. We made our first wine out of first vintage out of his winery in Berkeley which was really cool because we were making very different wines than what he was at the time. Mm. We had made his first orange wine with him. Um, the chilled red we did was a little different. So we started with two wines. Uh, one was a hundred cases. The other was 154 cases. The labels were completely inappropriate. The red was, uh, called first timers <laughs> and first timers sure. was like me standing in the doorway, naked, covering myself with a grape on the bed. Sure. So, sure. Uh, But, you know, it was genuine because it was literally the embodiment of how I felt releasing a very intimate product to the world. Like, it was nerve-wracking. And I think people understood that and and loved that it was personal. So, you know, we started with those two wines. Jason had a knack for these cider wines, and that was the next product we made. And uh, from there, you know, we had more relationship with farmers than we did from our first vintage. So we were able to get some Pinot and some shard and some other grapes that we love and kind of started to, you know, roll things up and do some more interesting things. So at our second vintage, we made, I think eight wines. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, now, uh, we just, we're probably making 12 to 15 this year. Mm. So yeah. Um, let's take a quick 
break because when I come back, I want to talk about like launching the wines and getting them out beyond just the stores, and then also how you've been working yourself into the community, um, and then go into a little bit more about the growth and then also some of the music that you listen to uh, yeah. when pairing with the wine. Um, we have a song from the archives here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network. Ain't that funny what you do to me You're my honey as far as I can see And you told me that you found someone new Ain't it funny what time can do Ain't that funny? Ain't that funny? What you do? What you do? It ain't that funny, cause I'm so blue. I could love a million girls or two, but I'll never be over you. money a car or two i'd pay your rent well i'd even steal for you i could break the law commit a crime or two ain't it funny what love can do yeah ain't that funny ain't that funny what you do what you do it ain't that funny because i'm so blue i could Win a million bucks or two, but I'll never be over you. Oh, one more time, Johnny. I'm gonna hit. Every bar in this doggone town Have a smoke, pop a pill or two Drink some whiskey and eat a big old steak too Ain't it funny what love can do Yeah, ain't that funny Ain't that funny What you do What you do It ain't that funny Cause I'm so blue I could drink a million beers or two, but I'll never be over you. I think I'll have a drink with a girl named Sue, but I'll never be over you. Welcome back to Snacky Tunes. We are here with Jonathan Yadigar, co-founder of Jumbo Time Wines. And before the break, we were talking about getting into stores and working with people who were figuring out distribution during the pandemic. But it's one thing to get into stores and it's another thing to say, um, pick my wine over your wine if you're a consumer who may just be going into a store and know nothing about it. How did you start reaching out to consumers? How did you start working with the public to get the word out? Yeah, so I think the biggest key in all that is we self-distribute all our wines in California, which mm. is the, the only market we actually have distribution in right now. Um, and I think why that's been so powerful is I'm the actual person selling the wine, right? And that means I'm selling it to the rep, the buyer, you know, the person that's hourly there, whoever it is, I'm getting to have that intimate conversation with the people that are, you know, the retail accounts that are buying wines from us. And I think we're easier to stay top of mind because when it's a distributor coming to sell you wine, there's a whole, you know, swath of different producers mm-hmm. that they're you know, pouring mm-hmm. for you and mm-hmm. you can't get so deep with everyone. And we were really keen on like, 
let's go to staff training before a service. Let's, you know, do uh, takeovers where we're pouring our wines and talking to customers. So I think that's what helped us stick out on the retail side is getting really deep with the buyers. And then um, in terms of the e-com business, you know, social media, I hate it. I really do. If it wasn't for Jumbo Time, I wouldn't have an Instagram. I still love sure. Instagram. It drives me nuts. But, yeah. you know, content's king. And we yeah, yeah, yeah. try to create stuff that's compelling that will get people to our sites and, you know, give them reasons to buy online. I think something that people don't realize as much as I wish they would is when you buy a bottle of wine on a winemaker's website versus a, your local wine shop, they make more money on the website. Mm-hmm. And yeah. shipping, shipping's expensive, we know, but uh, it's not like we're making that money, you know, FedEx no. and GLS, you know, and UPS, they, they got, they, you know, they're, I don't want them to think that I'm bad mouthing, but they're the ones that are making it expensive. And, you know, wine is... Uh, God bless them for getting the wine in people's hands, yeah. but if you could come down just a little. Yeah. So, you know, we do things, you know, I, I'll subsidize shipping and we'll lose money, but... I would on, you know, on the shipping portion of it, but I at least want people to like go through our experience and try our wines and, you know, we can ship to almost any state. So it's a nice way that I think we've done a good job building buzz in California and Mm -hmm. people, people outside of the state can feel that and they want to participate and we're trying hard to get distribution out of the state. Uh, something in the pipeline actually starting next month, we'll be in Chicago, which we're really excited about. Uh, Hey now. Snacky tunes exclusive. Snacky uh, Town exclusive. Yeah, um, there you go. So going back a little bit to design, and obviously uh, when you said you're getting started making inappropriate labeled wines, I will say one of the big facets of independent winemakers and sort of newer labels is the design uh, and sort of the branding identity of the wine itself, um, which has evolved into being something very specific, very fun, very raucous and and sort of that disco ball that you see in your mind i I think in some ways comes through with the label and and all that who does the design how do you reach them what's the process there how did you dial everything in to have a set visual language yeah so every label we've ever made uh we worked with one person her name is Mm. aiden romick Uh, shout out i want to say aiden romick i want to say that very clear so you know you guys can find her she is incredible we are so grateful to be working with her uh, we've been friends for a few years and she's an artist. She always mentioned she wanted to do wine labels. So fast forward like eight months, I was like, Hey, I think I have something for you. Cause I've always loved her work. Like we had a dinner party and she like didn't feel comfortable bringing wine because you know, I'm the wine guy. So mm-hmm, she brought, mm-hmm. she brought a hand drawn watercolor three by five of my dog. And I was like, wow, you know, this was wow. right up my, a- yeah, it was right up my alley of what I love. So I have a sketchbook where I draw like a three year old. Uh, I think that's being nice. And mm-hmm. I kind of write some bullet points to aid it of what I'm trying to accomplish and she'll bring them to life. And like she actually hand draws all the labels. So there's like originals of uh, a lot of our wow. labels. Yeah. Which is really cool. Um, so, you know, we've been working with her for a while and look, there's a lot of discussion around label labels and natural wine and you know, mm-hmm. a gimmick. And I, you know, I understand both sides of it. I think for me, we make the wines labels we make because it's just how my brain's wired. I want to create characters in a universe. And like, it's the easiest thing for me to be able to do is that. And it's like, you know, how do I create this generation's, you know, Ronald McDonald and Hamburglar without, you know, taking advantage of kids and selling them crap, you know, like, but they did a great job of, you know, you see those characters, you think McDonald's. Mm -hmm. So I want to get to a place where you can see a Jumbo time character and know it's one of our wines without even knowing that, you know, our labels on the label, our names on the label. So, Mm. you know, building out that universe has also been super helpful because, you know, branding across different efforts, you know, on our site, you know, if you, if you like look at, if you kind of screw around their site, there's some funny people like our 404 page is a a great (laughs) version. Have you ever seen that meme of John Travolta where he's like, it's from Pulp Fiction where he's like lost. He's looking around the house when he goes to meet Mia Wallace. So it's like they memed that. So we made it like a great version of that. It's, it's, it's honestly pretty funny. So like, um, you know, having everything systematized in my brain, you know, I think I'm creative in certain ways, but in others I need like templates on how to execute things. So, you know, knowing that has been super helpful. And then it's just like, okay, well, what do I like? So like, 
I like basketball. So we created a label called Game 7 because the wines were going to be coming out around the finals. You know, mm. like, you know, we, we made this Chardonnay that was like a joke on like a mom Chardonnay. So we called it Top Down and it's like, you know, two women Stop. in the convertible. Yeah. So it's like, you know, during... We created a little jumbo called Trick or Treat because, you know, it's around Halloween. It's a little pumpkin carving. And so It's world you know, building. Exactly. And um, everything is tongue in cheek. And Aiden is so good. Like the wine we made called The Gift is the goal of this wine was for you to bring this bottle to a dinner party when you didn't know what wine to bring. And the mm. label is a grape giving another grape a bottle of wine at a dinner party. Like it's very on the nose. It, it's it's very Gary Larson far side in some ways where it's a little macabre humor. It's like you're drinking yourself or you're drinking a yeah. friend. Well, it's funny because Aiden did this. She'll like throw in some Easter eggs that take me a while, like other people pointed out. But the on the bottle that the grape is giving the other grape, it's the label on the wine. So it's like very meta in that regard. Uh, so it's like this smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Yeah, exactly. So you have this good wine, you have uh, an approachable brand as well. And the wine itself is very drinkable, but you also came out during 2020, which was both in some way we said like a blessing and a curse because people were drinking at home more. So it encourages drinking, but people are going out less and, learning less about new things in some ways. How did you, beyond like direct selling and direct getting, like how did you grow the brand? How have you sustained it? And what shifted, you know, now that people are out of their house? I think we've had to be dynamic with what sales channels need the most fire given how people are consuming. Mm. So, you know, at first I wanted to be as much e-com as possible. Mm -hmm. which was obviously important, but I realized like the margin may be worse wholesale, but as much of a sales channel as it is, it's actually more of a marketing funnel than anything else. And just going really hard and getting our product to as many different pockets as we could. And then throwing events, you know, so every time we do a release, we try to take over a restaurant and do tastings and give people an opportunity to actually try the wines. I think like that gets lost in everything is like, yeah, people could buy it without tasting it for sure. And it could be sold, but you got to give people a chance to go buy a product to see if they actually like it. So, mm -hmm. you know, going out and like doing all that community marketing work is incredibly crucial to what, you know, getting the name out of there for the brand. And then I'd say the second biggest piece and all that is we've been really lucky to collaborate with some really awesome brands and people, mm -hmm. which has probably gotten the Jumbo Time name out there more than anything else. So Broad Street Oyster, Say Beauty, Freddie Gibbs, Simon Miller, we have some other ones, you know, in the pipeline. I think what's really cool about it is we are going to brands that have customers that probably buy our wine or probably would be into natural wine, but they don't know about us. And they're sure. buying like-minded product that's done with respect, but we're doing something that they can't do because making wine is uh one difficult, but comes with a lot of legal parameters. So we can help unlock <laughs> that. And like, it goes to my like bigger thing is I think personalization is really important for people. I mean, you can go on Etsy and make anything, but you can't make a wine. So what we're really working hard at is we're starting with the brands and doing these collabs, but it's my goal it's that you could come on my site and it's your buddy's bachelor party. and You can mm. get a photo of him in 2006 doing a keg stand and sure. submit that label, have me print three cases worth, you buy it online, it gets shipped to your door. And, you know, because you like our wine and we're the authority on the product and then we can unlock the actual personalization aspect. Um, I think that's really powerful for people. So we've seen a lot of stuff that's been working on the brand side, both private label and collaborative. So that's something we want to dip our toes in a little more. I mean, the idea of coming together and, creating special boutique wine for both, you know, that halo effect partnership, but then also people who are just going to tie it to a very specific memory, like a wedding or a bachelor party or your birth, you know, it's, it's sort of what gets at the communal idea of opening a bottle of wine and sharing it among people. And I always think about some of my best and favorite nights of drinking wine was around music, which I think jumbo time, like I said, at the beginning has a very strong association with, um, for people looking to pair some of the wine with some music, what would you recommend? I have the all encompassing jumbo time playlist that, you know, it's like the greatest dinner party playlist of all time. Can we share it 
when we share the episode? Yeah, I, I it's just a playlist I've been building for years. I don't know how to share it with you, but I'm happy to. I assume it's as easy as sharing on Apple Music. But yes, it's yeah, like yeah, a range. Yeah. It's a range of like you know old school hip hop, like some funk, um, a lot of soul music, you know, a lot of like random indie tracks, like just good feelings. Um, and I think the, like the reason why the playlist has so much range is I believe our wine also has range and I don't want us to feel typecasted in that way. So, mm. um, you know, like, as I was saying, like, I forget the, I think the song's called rubber band, but that, uh, that song, uh, hate it or love it by 50 cent and, uh, mm-hmm. the game, like the sample from that song, like it's a lot of music like that. Like, it's just like the, the things right. that are always playing in my head. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, that's great that you've are always thinking about what music will go with your wine and what wine will go with your music and how it all sort of works together in the world that you've built. And, you know, as you start to inch closer to a five year anniversary, you know, especially as a guy whose brain is so built on systems and, and looking at macro and micro problems, what do you hope to see just from the brand itself? What would you like to say when you, when you light that, birthday cake and crack open a magnum with five candles on it. What do you hope yeah. to see? I hope people just like see our brand and it isn't typecasted as a certain type of taste. It's like we are natural wine for people that like different things and like different wines. I think wine is so personal to everybody and everyone has their own specific type of wine they like. And if we can provide, you know, something for everyone, I think that would mean a lot for us. So, you know, and to my other point of like, you could just recognize the brand without seeing the name that speaks volumes to what we've been able to build. So that's really what we're pushing for. Amazing. Um, So if people want to order the wine and grumble about the shimping costs, but understand that that is not your fault, where can they order directly? How can they follow along? Where can they check out some of the artwork? Jumbotimewines.com for all ordering things. Uh, a lot of fun content on there as well. Uh, and then on Instagram, we're at Jumbo Time Wines, TikTok at Jumbo Time Wines. Amazing. And I'm looking forward to doing an event with you. You'll be pouring wine at the very first Snacky Tunes Salon beginning of we May. We'll be there. We cannot wait. We have a bunch of new stuff that uh, we're excited to share with y'all. It's going to be good. That's also an exclusive because we haven't announced it yet. But you get to do an exclusive and I'll, I'll, I'll so you're not out there on your own, I'll do an exclusive as well. Yeah, one more exclusive. April twelfth, four spring wines are coming to you guys. So uh, a rosé, uh, a sparkling red, an orange wine, and our first ever direct press Pinot Blanc. So a white wine. We're really excited. You're tasting great. Oh my god! You know, it's so funny. I have a text thread with my wife and two friends that's literally called chilled reds because it's just when when I realized you could actually have a cold red, I went, "The world's a different spot." It's there's before yeah. and after, before yeah. and after. That's you a big do, thing. You could do worse by sitting in a pool of the summer and drinking a chilled red. Yeah, we're uh, and that's a big thing for us. Is like you know a lot of family members that are a bit older. They're like, "What is? What did you do to red wine? You're ruining red wine." I'm like, "Just think of it as a heavier rosé. You know, don't get so caught up in dogma around what it should and shouldn't be. If it tastes good and it's made well, that's all that matters." Yeah, 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 yeah. No, a hundred percent. Well, Jonathan, thank you so much for taking time to chat with us. Really appreciate it. We have a song from the archives and a live performance here on Snacky Tunes on Heritage Radio Network.
This episode is brought to you by Roberta's, home of Heritage Radio Network for 10 years. Roberta's was founded in Bushwick in 2008 and has become one of the most iconic restaurants in the country. HRN made its home inside of Roberta's in 2009, and together they have become part of the DIY fabric of the neighborhood. Roberta's, the pizza restaurant, is open for lunch and dinner seven days a week and serves much more than just the famous wood-fired pizzas. Their team dreams up new salads, pastas, and sandwiches on the regular. Roberta's Tiki Bar is alive and well in the back garden, serving up frozen drinks in the summer and hot toddies in the winter. Stop by the bakery and takeout spot next door for fresh breads, sticky buns, and pizzas to go. And of course, there's the two Michelin-starred Blanca tucked away in the garden for truly daring diners. But Roberta's also extends beyond Bushwick, with multiple locations in New York City and now in Los Angeles. You can also find their frozen pies in grocery stores around the country. The spirit of Roberta's, like Heritage Radio Network, is everywhere. Here's to many more years of pizza-powered radio. Welcome back. Sun Voyager. Hey, boys. How's it going? Hello. Uh, good. Hello. There we go. Turned it off. I mean, it's a little vibey. Yeah. It's like a Sunday <laughs> afternoon vibe. I kind of like it. It would probably be annoying after a while, but for now, it kind of it works. Yeah. Lifelong... I'll keep it off. I'll keep it off for now. Okay. Lifelong friends. Yeah, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. How did you all meet? Yeah, and where? Are you, and you're from Orange County, New York, which I had never heard of until I heard about you guys. It's not bad. Uh, well, no, I mean, just there's another Orange County. It's uh, it's like there's a few cities that have like similar names in different states, and then there's the famous one, and then there's the other ones. It's like Orange County, New York. Yeah, yeah, they, and it, I feel like it. it still doesn't mean much to people when you tell them. They're like, "Oh, I've heard of that, but only in California." I don't right. know what that means in New York. What, is, what does Orange our, County, New York mean? Well, so, Orange County Choppers is out of Orange County, New York, not Orange County, California, if you can believe that. Do you remember um, those guys? Yeah. 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 Um, but, but Orange County, New York, it's, it's just like bottom of the state, uh, hour north of the city, beautiful scenery, uh, you know, in, along the Appalachians. And, um, you know, I don't know. We, we, we like... We like being from there. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more commonly referred to as the Hudson Valley. So we're like the lower Hudson Valley. The low Hudson. The low Hudson. Or yeah. the Orange County low Hudson. Sure. How did you all How did you all meet? How, when did you start becoming lifelong friends? Uh, so we all went to high school, high school together. Um, we were in a band um the very end of high school you know we were always playing music just different projects um throughout the years in high school and then in college we all went our different ways rejoined certain points you know through our college years and kyle's falling asleep as i'm giving this story <laughs> you probably heard it like i lived it yeah. i've yeah. heard it it's yeah. fine but when you reformed you started practicing in the back of a taco shop yeah, so that's my um, parents' restaurant. And, you know, I was going to school. Well, what's the name of the restaurant? Cafe Fiesta. Got a Dollar Tacos on a Monday? On uh, Monday, yeah. Monday Dollar Tacos. Yeah. Great. So, so, so I'm, I'm going to jump in the car with you, sleep over, and we'll do Dollar Taco Mondays tomorrow. Yes, I've had course. a couple thousand uh, Dollar <laughs> Tacos, so that's where yeah. all my money goes, pretty much. <laughs> yeah, even, I, you know, we're, we're part of the, the King Pizza label and i always encourage bands when they're touring north out of the city i always want them to come by and just kind of hang out and eat it's a nice little stop off when you're on the road where's the setup for rehearsal or practice or how did you convince them to let you use it for rehearsal and practice my parents have always been cool about that stuff growing up so we have a kind of a back room with tables so we just push the tables up against the wall lock the door up front and we just play, you know, we've had complaints once in a while over the years. Um, I remember one time we were loading out the side of the restaurant, all the equipment and a cop came by and he thought the place was getting robbed because <laughs> there's all these dudes in midnight, you know, we have to practice up to be closed. So weekdays, 10, 11, we can start practicing. And then it's one in the morning and we're carrying out all this equipment where a cop coming by, throwing the lights. He's like, busted guys. <laughs> we're like jokes on you we're a band yeah 
He's like, you're still busted. Yeah, then he, <laughs> then he found everyone's weed. And we all quit the show. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would you ever, speaking of that, would you ever turn on the griddle or anything and cook for yourself? Or it's like, I'm going to go back, take a break, make some food, come back, keep rehearsing? Uh, we, we, we snack. Yeah, we, we, we snack. We've uh, cracked into the uh, to the beer case a couple times too. Yeah, sorry, Dad. <laughs> sorry, yeah, Mom, I, yeah. yeah. It's it's like they can't a... they can't hurt you here. Is it, <laughs> you're totally safe on snacky too. <laughs> Have a couple uh, frozen margaritas, maybe. Yeah, yeah a couple <laughs> beer, frozen margaritas. margaritas. Yeah. Just like turn margaritas. on the machine, and when everything's cold, that's when you know how to break. It's like okay, it's margarita time. <laughs> Can we hear a song? Yeah. yeah what are you gonna play for us first? Uh, a uh, song Trip. called Trip. It's uh, we we released this a little while ago. Uh, and it'll be on our new uh, our new album coming out on uh, 420. Great. Sure, right around the corner. Here we go. Sun Voyager live on Snacky Tunes. about having bands come up and stopping by the taco shop what is the music scene in orange county and what are the venues that you have played in as as a band i mean it's it's you know it's the suburbs it's up in the sticks so there's there's not too much but you know there's always bars uh you know a cafe or two a bar as far as towns go uh, a lot of the towns along the river um have like the bigger cities where you see as you're going up the New York State Thruway towards Albany, every exit has uh, uh, a couple bars, a couple venues, um, Beacon, Newburgh, New Paltz. What are some of the venues? What like what's the if I'm a band from there? Like what route am I playing? What are the venues and what are the cities? Um, it's it's funny. It's it's a lot of uh, I mean Snug Harbor in New Paltz is a is a nice venue, and there are a bunch of like ran- basements with random names in New Paltz. Um, Quinn's and Beacon. Um, the yeah, there's a lot of a lot of colleges up there, and you can always rely on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. In in uh, in Newburgh, city of Newburgh is the warehouse. Um, 
the anchor in Kingston. Um, Half Moon in Hudson. One of our very early on, almost four or five years ago. Uh, we used to play there a lot, Half Moon. Uh, it's right below Albany. Yeah, and, and once you get into Albany, there's a good, I mean, you got a bunch of schools up there, so it, it, it keeps the scene alive. And and is, do you find that's pretty supportive? Is it small? Is it big? Does it change with the college season? Or, or do you find a lot of other bands or meet a lot of other bands that way? Or do you find a lot of it's fed from New York and, and it kind of diminishes as, as you move further up? I mean, there are definitely a lot of bands that are that are doing it in the Hudson Valley. Um, uh Geezer and It's Not Night at Space are two bands that we play with a lot up there. And there, there are a lot of younger bands that are doing stuff at like VFWs and stuff. Um, you know, Legion, you, Legion Halls? Yeah, yeah. Really? You'll, you'll, find, you'll find great shows at Legion Halls upstate. And uh, that's, that's pretty much where a lot of the scene lives because, you know, it's a lot of kids in high school and co- in college that aren't 21 yet. Right, so. and they can get the room and, yeah. and program it. Yeah, we we've done it ourselves before. <laughs> yeah, and, and and as a tip too for bands that are touring, if you're going to go to college towns, make sure schools in, because uh, the worst <laughs> thing is rolling into a city. Yeah, you in hit real, it on spring break, and it's, yeah, we've hit it on spring break. We've hit it in the not summer. Not like MTV spring break. It's, yeah, <laughs> you roll into the town, you're like, oh, there's no kids here, and that's because they're not in school. And who, who, who booked the sh- who booked the show? Was someone like, come on up, we'll get something together for you. Or did you just decide to play a bar or a VFW hall, or, or how did it? How did that happen? Uh, probably yeah. a promoter. I mean, they. they it's probably on us. Yeah, it's <laughs> probably, <laughs> more, more, more than likely, it was our fault. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, uh, you know, it's it's nice to drive upstate New York in the summer, right, and hit all these nice towns, um, but unfortunately, folks aren't really around. You know, and, well, and, and in the summer, you do get some of the festivals. We were lucky enough to do a uh, Melt Asia last year. That uh, that Savage Beast, uh, Andy mm-hmm. Animal, his uh, yeah. his festival there. Yeah, there is. Yeah, up up by uh, Catskill, New York. Um, these these guys actually lived up there for a little while. Um, up in yeah, nice. Kasaki, is that how you, is that the pronunciation? Yeah, it's something like that. It's off. It's off the throughway. Um, but the same day we played, Rocky Erickson headlined that night, which was real cool just to see him and uh, a giant dog from texas yeah. played before him it was, yeah, it, was, it was the best their killer killer band it was a good time can we hear another everybody song everybody was loaded <laughs> i bet can we hear another song i think we're out of songs mm. yeah, we only have one song. Oh, okay well thanks <laughs> for coming yeah. yeah our album is that song <laughs> yeah that's it just yeah. nine times yeah yeah, yeah. 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 yeah we're not too exactly. big on the uh, in the in the talent department we got some? okay yeah let's uh we're gonna do psychic lords i think yeah i'm gonna push the button push the pedals yeah it'll my be hands. uh this one's be on the record as well. I think it's the closer on the record, right? Nah. It's not the closer on the record? It's not the closer. God is dead is the closer. Well, it's guy with a drink. All right. Someone <laughs> give me another drink.
first LP is coming out on 420. You've put out a bunch of EPs before. What was it that made you feel that you were ready to do an LP and stitch together something a lot longer? Well, I, we thought about it for a while. And I guess at other times we just didn't have enough songs or kind of felt forced. But uh, some of these songs we wrote, we wrote like maybe even like two or three years ago, we kind of held on to them. Uh, we recorded one of them. And then the other ones, we just kind of sat down and hammered out. Yeah, we went into the studio with a lot of ideas. Um, some not completely done or uh, there were a, a few that didn't make it. Uh, and when we knew that we had enough songs to do an album, we just knew that we had to do it. Yeah, and I, th- I think when you listen to each EP we've put out since 2013, uh, the sound kind of changes. It evolves a little bit, moving in a different direction. And then I think we all just naturally felt, okay, we're at a point where we have a sound that we we feel like we got somewhere. So let's yeah. And we were writing a lot of songs as a four piece uh, back in the day, and um, I mean, even we we play songs as a three piece, and then another guy would come in and and play guitar. This one was really the three of us, and we wrote a lot of a lot of pretty pretty. Uh, uh, I mean, the sounds are very different. And we had a uh, we had our boy uh, Evan come in. Uh, yeah, we had a friend come in and play some keys. And, yeah, uh, he shreds. But for the most part, it was just, uh, you know, song and, uh, after song. And uh, I got to shout out Paul Ritchie, uh, the guy that recorded it. Uh, sir Paul you know, Ritchie. Yeah, sir, sir Paul Ritchie. Ritchie. Yeah. A, a proper sir? Yeah, sir. He, was knight, yeah. Uh, he was knighted. He was knighted in New Jersey, so it's not as, it doesn't hold as much weight. But, I think uh, he's got a couple Asbury it's, Music Awards it's, to his it's name. It's London, New York Yeah, is where he was knighted. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like yes. Yeah. yes. Is there a London, New York? No, of course there is. It's on Long Island. Yeah, it's on Long Island. Uh, to, to go back to your point about having a sound that evolves, do you feel that the EPs, the sound that you're at, could be captured on an EP, but the LP was needed to demonstrate how the depth of it and how much it's changed and really be able to have that much time to explore how your sound has evolved to at where you're currently at? Yeah, I, I think so. And, you know, the thing about this record, it's, it's not so much like a one-note record. There's a lot of records... You listen to, and it could be just one very long song. You know, there's a sound, and they drive that sound. When I say we have a sound, it's more of a vibe. A lot of these songs are, you know, some are much more mellow. Others are a lot more aggressive. But it's still the thing we were kind of seeking the whole time. You know, it's a, a lot of these songs kind of um, flow at a different pace very nicely. It's not just one sense of a song and it's you know eight times you know i think each song is unique but really fits our sound i think and how do you feel that you evolved to this place from your previous eps and how you got to a place where it is a a deeper level and it is not just one note did you push each other was in the writing process how did you get to this point yeah i I think that we we started to uh just just really feel motivated by um, inactivity at one point, you know, it, it had been a while since we had recorded and, um, we wanted to get back into the studio. We wanted to really, um, push ourselves and, um, you know, so we, we would get together and just really jam. Um, we'd all come to the table with ideas. And I think that the motivation really just, just carried us. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and the, the folks that were surrounded by, down here you know the the king pizza crew uh there's always some band in the studio putting things out on tour um so having that uh competitiveness with your friends i think uh helps helps get things done and um you know greg hansen has has been you know the main person behind us since the beginning uh supporting everything we've done so having someone behind us um certainly helps too. You don't feel like you're out there doing it alone. Greg has been just tremendous godsend for us. You have a record release coming up at Babies. We yes. do. Who else is on the bill? Our friend Sty Died, who rip. It'll yeah. be uh just like a is that a capital R rip? Like a proper yes. ripage. Yeah, they're yes. killers. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah we just kill <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um yeah they're violent uh yeah. violent guys. But uh we we just played uh, some gigs with them on our way down to South by Southwest. We were just there a few weeks ago. Stydide was on the road as well. We met with them in Dallas, played some 
priest south by got violently drunk yeah with them. but uh i have very, very hospitable place uh texas despite what to, I it is or, or to get violently drunk or just yeah. Yeah. hospitable oh. all, all right. of the above yeah. definitely yeah the beer flows like uh like I think out. those guys are always pushing us to get more, more drunk. drunk yeah. Right. I mean, Luis specifically uh, is is a guy who is always pushing you to get more drunk, and um, I, I have to thank him. I have to thank him for that. So mission accomplished. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this guy was putting back maybe you know six or eight beers before noon. You know what I mean? Like sounds like a sure. sounds like a proper South by Southwest. Yeah. It's like you know, it's like I don't normally have ten whiskeys before yeah. I have breakfast, but. Why not? Yeah. But what if I did? You yeah. don't play a show without it. Readjusting yeah, exactly. on that Monday. Yeah. Adjusting you know, the, the sim life. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I have come off many a South by going, oh, this is why this is not forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we want to make sure we have time for one more song, but uh, where can people pre order the record, buy the record? Uh, Seismic Vibes is out on April 20th on King Pizza Records, which is going to be so rad. Yeah. Uh, you can you can pre order it on King Pizza, uh, kingpizzarecords.com. There's a store link. And um, we're, we're going to be up all over the place, wherever you can download music on Bandcamp. Um, Love Bandcamp. Yeah, yeah. They're the you best. Can, you can buy the record on Bandcamp, too. Um, help, help, the, help the cause, help the King Pizza cause, help, the, help Sunny V do it. Yeah, there's yeah. a lot of good stuff in the King Pizza shop to check out. A lot of yeah, good shit. And they, they might give you a twofer. Ooh. Then I don't know if they'll give you a two for No. One. We'll give you a two for one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I'm not talking about two for one. Yeah. <laughs> and where can people find you, follow you, see your upcoming shows, get um, more tips on how to tour summer colleges? Best. Yeah, you could our, our website has links to everything, sunvoyagerband.com, and all, all of our shows are usually listed there. Perfect. We, we got a lot of really cool merch we're gonna be rolling out at the record release. Some limited edition stuff and then just a bunch of other. We have dugouts. Really cool stuff. That so. you can smoke with. Okay. One hitter, one hitters come with them. Um, might, might come with some, some, some real dirty swag weed too. We, yeah, we might. Yeah, we're, we're we, down on your lock, hey, you know what I mean? We might pack hey, them. You won't know until you go. Yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, we want to thank uh, Andrew Friedman. Uh, please make sure to go pick up a copy of Chef's Drugs and Rock and Roll. Sun Voyager, thank you for coming by. We really appreciate it. What's the name of the last song you're going to play for us it's called open road open road tune in next week for a 350th episode it will be the live snacky tunes event we did out in la you get to hear naya wexler's deli and thanks for tuning in take us away thanks for having us
Snacky Tunes is powered by Simplecast. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. Keep in touch at heritageradionetwork.org slash subscribe.